Have you been thinking about relaunching a tired or underperforming book series? Well, we're going to talk with Kevin McLaughlin, who did just that. He took one of his series that at best was doing three figures a month, relaunched it under his process, and from that, he delivered multiple months of five figures or more. Along with that, we're going to talk with Kevin about his new book. It's a nonfiction book, not his typical sci-fi, called You Must Write. And it goes over Heinlein's rules of writing and his interpretation of them. Okay, one more thing before we get started with Kevin. I want to talk to you about the year end. I don't know if you know this, but I've partnered with Lisa Gardena. And we've been working with authors that are doing $200,000 or more a year and helping them with their back office. Now, fortunately for them, they can afford to hire us to do all that hard work. But the other thing that we've done together is we've put together some stuff to help those of you that aren't at that point yet. Now, I know you can get there, and you're going to get there faster with our help. There's a couple things to look at. First off, we have our 72-hour business challenge. This is completely free, and it is a challenge to help you get into 2019 with a simple business plan, not something overcomplicated. Literally, you can be writing this stuff on post-it notes, but it will help you to have a plan for 2019. Now, the other thing is if you're in the position where you're really starting to make some money and you want to figure out how to best optimize your tax situation as a sole proprietor with the new tax laws, we have a course called Sole Proprietor Simplified that Lisa and I have put together, and it's going to be opening at the beginning of the year. It's going to help you get your 2018 taxes done, and it's going to help you be ready for 2019. With the new tax laws, this is going to be a big help. And I guarantee you, if we don't cover the cost of the class in savings and taxes, you can get your money back. So go take a look. There's links down below. Give it a try. Now let's get on with Kevin and hear what he did to relaunch a tired series. Hi, everybody. It's Joe Solari, and today I'm here with Kevin McLaughlin. Hi, Kevin. Hey. So we're going to talk about a couple of things. Um, first off, we're going to start up talking about uh, Kevin's got a nonfiction book. If you don't know Kevin, he writes mostly science fiction, right? Right. Uh, but he did this year also squeeze in time to get out a nonfiction book. Um, and then I wanted to dive into... Some real interesting stuff that Kevin did. Was it 2017 or 16 that you did your relaunch? Uh, 17 and then again in 18. Okay. So we're going to talk about relaunching a book. But let's first start talking about You Must Write. So, uh, You Must Write is an introduction to using Heinlein's rules for writers. Uh, I first got introduced to the idea of Heinlein's rules from Dean Wesley Smith back in the early days of me getting into the indie scene. And uh, so you, you read his book on that or? Um, I actually I read, on. he wrote, I, never, I have never read his book on it. Um, mm-hmm. I read his articles on it, which I think he uses the basis for the book he wrote. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was a lot of years ago. Uh, in since then, I've kind of just started incorporating them into my own writing and Dean and I actually differ in some of our interpretations of it, but uh, we're fairly similar. Mm -hmm. So how do you think it's um, influenced your work? I do not think I would be a full-time writer without them. Mm, Okay. And um, is it more like how you're writing your stories or just really your work ethic that, that it's driving? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so, I, I mean, you're like rule, you got to kind of break them down rule by rule, right? Yeah. Rule number one is, is you must write. And uh, that kills about 99% of all would-be writers right there. Mm. All the aspiring writers out there who want to write a book someday, 99% of them never even start. So this is a reminder for me as a professional writer that I need to be writing all the time. I need to put words on the page. If I don't put words on the page, then I'm not earning income. Mm. Uh, It's not something where I can just sit back. We talk about residual incomes from things and that is true to some degree, but um, only if you actually keep on pushing the books and the biggest way to push a book is to release a new one. So that's for sure. You know, I, I, I make at least 10 cents a word on everything I write averaged out. 
Mm-hmm. So if I write 5,000 words in a day, it's a 500 word day, which is not a bad day. You talk a little bit more about that. You mentioned when we were having lunch out in Vegas that, you know, you have that number um, kind of as a driver for you. Um, kind of um, flesh out what, how you've come up with that equation that 10 cents a word and Sure. I, well, I, I looked at my, what I'm earning mm-hmm. uh, per book and I looked at the word count per book and mm-hmm. I, I pretty much just, just broke it down like that. Now I think I'm actually estimating low okay. because over time, some of my older books have made, have made enough more that I think it's, I think it's uh, pushed that number up a little bit. Mm-hmm. I'd rather estimate low than high. And so what this is really marking is it's marking like the first six to 12 months of sales on an average. Okay. It also brings into account, you know, it calls into account things like you must write, which didn't earn as much as my novels do, but I like to write it because I, I, I like to give back to the writing community. A bunch of people like Dean, like Joe Conrath, uh, you know, a few other folks uh, early on in my writing career helped me out. And so you know, books like that are, are not a huge money maker. They're more designed to kind of uh, uh, give back. Yeah, sure. But, you know, I think that's a, a great, you know, kind of motivational tool for, for writers to think about. Just like, okay, you know, how many words you've produced, what your income is, and now you have a fee, you've got you've got some kind of benchmark, right? And you can look at that. Um, also how it's trending year over year. Is it getting, you know, higher each year or, you know, is it or dropping? And, and if it is, you know, what, should, what can I do to fix that? You yeah. know, if I notice those numbers dropping, it means maybe I'm not writing the right things. Mm. I need to focus on, you know, writing to my market better. Maybe I need to focus on finding a new market because my market's flooded something, you know, mm. um, I can, there's a science fiction fantasy is so big that I can always find something interesting to me to write about within those confines. Mm-hmm. It's, just, you know, going where the readers are is sometimes useful. Mm-hmm. Kind of on that point, do you, do you feel that you write to uh, different markets more or do you really have kind of a, a growing audience that's just looking for Kevin's fiction? So the way I describe this and, uh, it was borrowed. Actually, somebody else borrowed it. I don't remember who for 20 books Vegas this year. And I was kind of flattered, but the way I've described this for years for folks is imagine a Venn diagram with two big circles. And one of the big circles is things people like to read. And the other big circle is things I like to write about mm-hmm. where those two circles overlap, write that. Mm. Um, and I'm lucky. I have a, I have a big overlap in my, <laughs> my Venn diagram. <laughs> I, I, I like to write, you know, popular science fiction and fantasy stuff. Um, I like adventure stories and action mm. stories. Um, so I like to write what people like to read, which is a plus. But most people, I think, will have some area where they overlap with a bunch of readers mm. and, and focus on that area. Yeah, I've, the way I've put it, it's similar as, um, you know, if, if you can find something you love to write and you can find something that people love to read, that's, that's where the money is, right? Yeah. Nowhere does there have to be quality or good or, um, well, quality in the, in the sense of, you know, some people say, oh, well, you know, that guy, I don't really think he's a good writer. It's like, well, that doesn't matter. He's got a huge fan base that thinks he's a good writer, right? Uh-huh. Uh, I, I mean, you know, like we, I, I think everybody knows an example of a writer or two who's managed to reach, you know, like zillions of people. Um, but has also been panned for uh, not writing well in the process. And, you know, so I think that you could take it both ways. You can work on, I always work on improving my quality book by book. Mm -hmm. Every book I write, I write with the intention of focusing on improving my own skills in the process. Um, So constant self-improvement, I think, is useful and important as an artist. But at the same time, I'm also trying to write a book that people are going to like to read. Right, right. Like that's part of it too, is understanding what, um, you know, what the audience is expecting, you know. 
a lot a lot of stuff that's out there is not meant to be winning Pulitzer Prizes. That's not people don't want to read that. So um, no one. Your market for that is just not very big. <laughs> right, right. Um, so it, it, back on the topic of Heinlein, um, you, you hit rule number one. There's five rules, right? So yep. You, you want to give some tips on some of the others that have kind of changed your world when you encountered them? Absolutely. Um, rule number two is you must finish what you write. And when I was starting off, I had a bunch of different part finished stories in files in on my computer. And that's death for a writer. It kills really, I would say 99% of the 1% who remained <laughs> because if you don't finish a book, you can't get it out there for readers. If you don't get it out there for readers, you're, you're never going to become a professional writer. Mm. So um, for somebody aiming to become a professional writer, the, that second rule is, is critical. And that includes revision cycles. So if you're sitting there revising your book for five years, that's, you know, five years where, and I've known people who have done this, who have, you know, sat there working on a book and they write the first draft and then they revise it for five more years. And that all of that time is time that you're not learning by writing new words. It's also time when the book's not getting finished. Mm. So finish what you write. Worse than that even is the abandoned draft because I've had this happen too. Uh, I get partway through a novel and all of a sudden I'm, uh, really interested in this other idea over here <laughs> and mm. if you drop the idea and go chasing the other idea, then that's a real problem because you'll end up with a whole bunch of half finished books. You got to actually push through the hard part and, and get to the finish. Mm. It's funny you mentioned this. I just had a call with um, a, a writer who is in a situation where uh, they've just been let go of their full-time job. And um, they've got uh, themselves in a little bit of a quandary because they've got this first draft that's not done. It's just like you said, now they've got like a bunch of other stuff that's come off of it. And they've set this expectation of um, they want this to be part of three books for a rapid release. So now it's like you're talking about trying to get three books done um, and you know, what I talked to this person about was, is maybe you just need to get that first book out and have that book out there to get some feedback and find out if there is an audience before you spend another, whatever period of time it is, getting all this stuff together that maybe people aren't going to read. So rapid release is a, is a valuable tactic. And it, it can be, it can really boost a series, mm -hmm. but it's most effective when you're either writing at a rate of a book a month or faster, or when you know your books are going to do really well. Mm -hmm. uh, for That's a writer who, who already knows that they have an audience. I know some science fiction writers who only write a few books a year, but every time that they come up with a new trilogy or a new quartet or whatever, they rapid release launch it. Their name shoots back up into the top 100 on, on, uh, science fiction authors, stays there for a few months, they make bank on those books, and then their name slides off out of the top 100. And, and, and meanwhile, they're writing new books and getting mm -hmm. ready to do it all over again. But they know already that they have a good market for their books. Mm. So that's it's problematic for the new author who may not know yet. Um, if you're, if the new writer is writing fast, I would still recommend shooting for a rapid release. And if you just lost your job and you're desperately trying to turn writing into a living, I would honestly, I would recommend sitting down at the keyboard for the same eight hours a day that you were sitting down at your day job and don't get up until you have 10,000 words finished. Yeah. And that was where I was coming from is, is that I certainly understand that you may want to like the worst thing you can be in when you're in that situation is, is split, you know, a split personality and where I'm trying, you know, I really don't know which way I want to go. Right. So do I want my, do I want to find another day job? Do I want to be a writer? So if you are going to, because I've been there, I mean, a lot of people have been there. Right. So, um, you know, if you can take and compartmentalize your life, right. Like, Hey, I'm going to put in 
eight hours today on finding a new job. And then the next day is going to be, I'm going to put eight hours in to my writing day job. Right. You know, and, and I, I would, what I said to this person is if you're really, really serious about it, act like as a writer is like, you're trying to get that job, right? Like when we've all gone for a new job, we, we dress better. We make sure our resume is all right. You know, we do all this stuff to impress, to win that job. But what would you do? You know, when, when it's yourself and you're kind of your own boss, you tend to slide a little bit, right? Act like you're trying to win that, that job of being a full-time writer. Um, and it's hard when you're in that funk, right? But, but like nowhere's in there is there four hours on the Xbox, right? <laughs> no, because if you if you just spend four hours of the, on the Xbox in the middle of your work day at a regular job, you're going to get fired. Right, right. You know, um, you know, you have to. In so I don't know this person's exact situation. You know, like my situation, my t- my risk tolerance when I was, you know, like. 22 and single and, and didn't have a lot of ob- debt obligations or anything else is was, was very different from my risk tolerance at, at now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where I'm at now, there is no way I would have quit my job unless I was already earning, you know, sol- a solid income for my writing. Um, right. I would have gone and gotten another job. In fact, I did get fired from a job once during my early writing days. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the company let go some folks and I, uh, immediately went hunting for a new job and got one pretty rapidly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would, you know, I would really ass- carefully assess risk tolerance. Uh, do you have a mortgage? Do you have children? Do you need to keep your, uh, your medical insurance running for some reason or another? Uh, all of these mm-hmm. things are big factors. And if you're, the risk is too high, I would focus on the job in the short term at least and then build up the writing career slowly over time because it's easier to build up a writing career slowly when you have a safety net in place to handle the basics. You know, nobody's going to be writing really well when they don't have a, you know, a, a, when they don't know that the, the rent or mortgage is paid, when they don't know that food is only going to be on the table securely. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a lot harder to write, honestly, when you're, when you're stressing out about the basics. Sure. Sure. Well, and the other part of it is too, is if you are deciding where like, you know what, this is my time where I'm going to go and go full time, you still need a plan, right? Like, um, mm-hmm. there, there's, you need to, you need to be really serious about like, okay, how much, how much run, runway do I have here as far as cash before my books really need to kick in? You know, what kind of um, cost do I need to cut? I mean, there's, I think that's where a lot of folks that find themselves in that situation. And, and I know because I've been there is there's a period where you're panic, right? You don't have, you're not even thinking about a plan, right? But if you do have one, like, oh, wow, like, all right, I got let go. I've got a 401k. I can, you know, I can figure out a way here. Like you said, if I'm in a situation where I, I don't have those levels of risk um, and, you know, just overhead, um, maybe, maybe there's, it is the right time to put that effort into um, really getting after your career as a writer. Sure. And, and you can look at it from a perspective of, uh, you know, like, you know, you're getting paid two months later for everything. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's when Amazon's paying and the most of the retailers too. Uh, you know, you're getting paid two months later for everything. So if you start in January, publish your first book in January and you're not going to get paid for that, for that stuff until uh, the end of March. Yeah. Um, Calculate out what you've got, how many months you've got, and then start looking at, you know, like whether or not that income from that first month or two is going to tide you, is going to, is going to extend that well enough or not. Yeah. 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 Uh, And look at that equation we talked about earlier too. Uh, How much is each book earning you in those first Mm -hmm. few months? If your book splashes and it's making $5,000, that first book, 
um, that's awesome. It's also weird and unusual. <laughs> you know, like if, if you get, get lucky, ride and that then, unicorn. You know, you know if, if if you get lucky and hit the right notes with the readers, if you have a great cover and maybe some other authors are sharing to their list, stuff like that, you could do that potentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you're doing great. Now you know that that sixty thousand word book made you five thousand dollars, and you can calculate out your your uh, pennies per word. Hmm. So let's um, rule number, th we kind of went off on a tangent there, but I think it was kind of a good one. Rule yeah. number three, number three. Rule number three is the tough one. <laughs> rule number three is you must not rewrite except to editorial order. Okay. What this means is that um, all right, so understand this was written back in the 1940s mm -hmm. when everybody was working on manual typewriters. Sure. So to rewrite a draft meant to take the original pages and completely retype them into the, into the typewriter to, to clean stuff up. Mm -hmm. So the sort of cleanup that we do now where we're tweaking sentences or, 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 or changing stuff around, that didn't exist back then. We, could, yeah. we couldn't really do it. And uh, if you had more than a few corrections on a page, you could go back, you could XXX to close stuff out, and then they had correct, correct type to correct stuff. Um, but you well, could- Well, and the, the cut, you know, we, what we call cut and paste today, like in those days, it was you actually physically cut the paper and pasted it. <laughs> I never actually did that. I, I, I did early work on a manual typewriter, yeah. but it was, it was, it was all X, X, X because yeah. uh, mom, mom wouldn't buy me uh, correct type. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> then it was correct type too. And uh, uh, you know, if you had more than a few markups per page though, um, you had to retype the whole page and this is costing you time, which is effectively costing you money. Mm. So people tended to try to type as clean as possible in their first draft. They tried to not have a lot of mistakes, and, and they, it was really rare to rewrite a, a, a scene from scratch, let alone rewrite the book. Mm. So um, what Heinlein is saying is write a good, clean first draft that requires as little modification as possible. And then when it goes to the editor, in his case, the editor at a publisher, who might then suggest some changes to it, and you, know, you can go back and make those changes, sure, because the editor is the one writing the paycheck. Yeah. You know, yeah. the editor is the one handing you, handing you the money for the book. So if they request changes, go make the changes. In our case as indies, the editor is someone we hired to make the book better. So likewise, if the editor is suggesting changes, you might want to go and make those changes. If you've hired a dev editor who says that, you know, like your plot sags in this spot, you might want to go in and fix that. Mm -hmm. That's writing, that's re re rewriting or revising to editorial order. Makes sense. Uh, if we've hired, if you hire an expert to do a job and then don't listen to the expert's recommendation, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's not really doing you any good. <laughs> so I would, I, I would tend to follow the editor's recommendations unless I strongly disagree for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then maybe I need a different editor, you know, if we're disagreeing. Yeah. With that. yeah. They're not getting what you're trying to do. Then there's probably something bigger there. Right. Number so, this is really hard for people because everybody's been taught from like eighth grade, sixth grade on, you know, to rewrite their book or to rewrite their essay in class multiple times. Mm -hmm. And you know, so we carry it over to our books and we expect to have to go through rounds of revision. Um, my method, and this has been my method for years now, is to write a single first draft, send that draft to my editor. The editor proofreads it, copy edits it sends me back the edited manuscript. I go through either accept, deny, accept, deny, accept, deny uh, on all of their changes, track changes, and then that's the finished manuscript I publish. That's it. I don't revise. I don't change stuff. If I spot something on my read-through, uh, you know, on, on a read-through as I'm going through, I might tweak something here or there, mm -hmm. um, you know, change a word where I'm like, oh, you know, that was silly. But it's not a big there's no big changes. Sure, sure. Rule number four? Are we on? Rule number four is you must put your work on the market. Mm. Um, in the old days, 
that meant sending it out to publishers until somebody accepts it. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, you know, it, if you get 10 re rejections, send it to an 11th and then a 12th and then a 13th and keep on going. Keep on, it, no matter, you know, no matter how many books you have out on submission, keep on submitting them every time they come back. So that way you can keep on trying different markets until somebody finally accepts it. Mm. Uh, in the new market, it just means to upload it someplace. How yeah. dare. Uh, I've known some folks who, who for that first book or the first couple books, they're sitting there like with their finger hovering over the publish button and they, 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 they want to push it, but they, they, they're like, Oh, it's so hard. That first, the first little bit, it can be so difficult. Um, push the button, mm. publish, you know, just do it. The worst thing that's going to happen is that nobody will read it. <laughs> that's really the worst thing that's going to happen is nobody will read it. Um, and uh, you can always fix that. Mm. Yeah. And, and I, I think the other thing is, um, except for kind of mean spirited, uh, reviews that you, some people get a lot of folks that, you know, when they do comment on a book, um, it's because they care enough about the book to give you feedback, mm -hmm. right? Like that, that's actually, you know, most people are like, I don't like that book. They're not even going to take the time to go give you a review. They don't care. Like they'd sign to the next book. But if, so, yeah, especially if, right. Um, if you've got an audience, um, a mailing list that, somebody writes you back and says something, it's because they, they really care about your work. They want, they want to help you. They're not mm -hmm. trying to be mean. They're trying to, you know, help you as much as they can. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, a lot of writers say never read your reviews. Uh, I pretty much always read mine. And mm -hmm. I think it's important to remember that they're not talking about you. They're not talking about me. They're not attacking me as a person. These people have never met me. Um, they're talking about the book and how it made them feel. So when a reviewer's writing this scathing review, it's really more about them than it is about me. It's, it's their feelings that are put, they're putting down in that review. I read the reviews so that I can take information from them. I, I read reviews because... Uh, it might give me some tip. I'm writing too short. They didn't like this character. They did like this character. You know, like uh, they love this book because of X or they hate it because of Y. It, it's important information because I can learn from that. I can mm -hmm. learn little bits and pieces and that'll make my future books better. Yes. So I, I do read my reviews. I think it's up to the individual author and how thick your skin is and whether or not you can remember the, the reviews aren't really about the author. They're about how the book made the reader feel. Yeah. And if you are that like um, in the case of um, my wife, she's um, does these nonfiction books. Um, she really has a hard time with reviews. And so I read them. Mm -hmm. Right. And a part of it is in that nonfiction fashion category, you can get some real kind of catty stuff, mm. but um, her second book the idea of it came from a review, right? So it was a, it was a, a, a reader that was like, hey, I love the first book. This is what I'm looking for. It, you know, I would love for you to write about this. Mm -hmm. So when it came time, it was like, you know, I'm thinking about doing another book. It's like, well, here's the idea. <laughs> right. right. What the audience wants. And guess what? It's sold. So, um, yeah, I think that it's um, – it's an amazing resource. Uh, yeah, it's scary sometimes and it can hurt, but um, to get feedback like that, it's a, it's a, it's an important thing. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, so on rule five, rule five is the weird one because it doesn't really apply as well as it, as well as it once did. Um, it, it is keep it on the market until it's sold. And, uh, Back then, it required that we're talking about sending it back out to publishers over and over and over until you sell the book. Mm -hmm. So t today, um, if you're writing in the indie world, it's talking more about the the fact that backlist is gold, mm -hmm. and backlist is has the potential to continue making you money um, over and over. 
but you have to continuously renew and refresh and, and, and push the backlist. It, it's not enough just to leave it out there. I have some books that I've just sort of left out there that sell a copy once in a while, but until I do something to refresh or push them out again, they're really not going to move very many copies. Mm-hmm. Amazon is where almost all indie sales happen. Um, almost, we're almost all 85% of global English language ebook sales happen on an Amazon web store. So, uh, you know, Amazon's churn is so intense that if a book starts sinking, it basically vanishes from reader's view. Mm. Uh, after a very short period of time without any kind of push from the author, a book will go away and readers won't be able to find it unless you direct them to it. There are things you can do to help encourage Amazon to market the book again for you. And there are things you can do to market the book and bring it back up again. Mm -hmm. But you know, you have to keep doing those things. Otherwise it's not going to, it's not going to sell. Well, and I think this is a perfect segue into the other topic that I was hoping we could get to, which was, you know, uh, a year ago uh, when we first met out in Vegas at the first 20 books, you were just in the midst of doing a relaunch and there was a lot of work and you were talking about it. And I, my ears peaked up that here, like, ah, this is, this is something that probably is going to be a tool that a lot of people should know about um, to, you know, salvage is probably the wrong word, but to, to renew and um, refresh work. Yeah. So this is actually talking about the Starship Satori series and the adventures of the Starship Satori, which started off as a five book serial novelette series a long time ago. And it didn't sell as, as five, like 15,000 word stories. And so, that was what year, just to give people Oh, context. boy, like that was like 2015, I think, or 2016. Um, it, it, didn't, it didn't sell. And uh, I, there were a variety of reasons for that. It was too short. The covers were not good. Um, but I got some advice from uh, T.S. Paul about the covers, and he said, put them into novellas, not novelettes. Make them a little bit longer. So I merged together um, two, of the, two of the novelettes, uh, merged together the other three, so I had two books, and then I wrote a third novella for the series, and I rapid released all three of those in fall of 20, I guess it was 2015 for the first one, it was 2016 for this launch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and they did pretty well. They actually um, got me my first four figure month ever, and I never had a month with less than four figures again after that which was really cool. Uh, You know, it was a big success. The problem that I ran into down the road was that I was continuing to extend this series. I was at seven books and then eight books. And um, the, now nine books. Um, The first one was 26,000 words, but my new ones were like 60,000 words. (laughs) So I was getting longer on the later ones, 50, 60,000 words. And, um, the first book was 26,000 words long. So readers were, you know, like seeing that first one and and being like, eh, I'm not going to read a bunch of these little books. Yeah. What I did in the fall of 2017 was I rewrote the first couple of books and I expanded them enormously. So the first book went from 26,000 words to 42,000 words. Okay. Um, It was a big, big change. And um, I didn't change the plot line any, I added additional scenes which fleshed out the characters in more depth. And I added a lot more internal. I, I gotten better since I wrote them originally. I mm-hmm. add a lot more internal, internal dialogue. Uh, I added more emotion by getting into the characters' heads a little bit more. The book was so much better for it. And uh, the extra length, I think, helped pick up readers' attention better too. The, I re-released them in November, the very beginning of November 2017, right before going to the conference. And by the time I was at Vegas 2017, they were starting to really pick up a lot. The first few had been launched and they were starting to pick up in sales, like spiking like crazy. What I didn't know at Vegas 
was that by December 2017, I was going to have my first five-figure month ever because of that relaunch. The relaunch was a huge success, uh, continued to sell at very high levels for January and February as well as December. And um, I, I, those are still some of my best months to date. Mm. And, and in going through that process, what do you, and kind of looking back at it now, what, if you, you were going to help somebody to understand how to do this with a series that needed to be refreshed, what would you suggest or kind of the steps to go through? Okay. Well, the first thing is, you know, I'm, I'm going to assume you have a set of books out that you think is not selling as well as it should be a little old, at least a year or two old mm -hmm. and is, you know, something that should be refreshed. Make sure your covers are genre appropriate at the moment, and this changes. So what is genre, genre appropriate today is not going to be genre appropriate in two years. Uh, so refreshing the covers every couple of years is a useful thing, making sure that they are up to date. Sometimes they won't need refreshing, but often they will. Mm -hmm. um, if you're, what I did was I added a bunch of stuff. I added a bunch of material to it. So I added a little blurb on the new version and said, uh, this author's preferred edition is 60% longer than the, than the original. And I, I said something like, uh, you don't need to read this. If you've already read the original, you don't need to read this one too, but this is the, the author's you know, preferred, preferred edition and, and has lots of extra depth and information and fun stuff. Mm. Um, and then I, 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 so I warned people, if you read the first one, you don't have to read this one because I was uploading it as a new book. Okay. So I took down the original and uploaded this as a second edition, new version of the book, new ASIN, new ISBN uh, on, the, on the print book. So this stuff was, Amazon was treating it like it's a fresh book, which I thought, I thought was fair since it was 60% longer. It really was a fresh book. Sure. Uh, the, that meant that Amazon's algorithms kicked in and started marketing it to people. So they saw it as a fresh material, as fresh material. I got that new release first 90 day window again to make a whole bunch of sales where Amazon was pushing it. And my initial sales were strong enough that, uh, I did some advertising, some co-promotion, uh, send it out to my list. My, initial sales were strong enough that the whole series popped up a lot and Amazon pushed it a lot, which was where I got that big boost from. Mm -hmm. How big's your uh, list? Uh, right now it's about 15,000. At that time? What, what, what? Less, uh, like 12, I think or so. Okay. So it's still a decent sized list. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things that I did, people worry about our relaunch. Well, what if your readers, you know, run into it? So I did put the warning. What if your readers run into it, buy the copy that they've already bought and then get mad. I used the same title, which I think is key. This is a second edition of the same title. They're going to recognize that and they're going to recognize the, um, the name. I put the warning at the bottom of the blurb on Amazon. Okay. So that, that way they know this is the same book you've already read. <laughs> it's right there in the blurb. Uh, then I actually, with the first one, I actually gave out a free copy of it to everyone on my, on my email list who wanted one before I went live on Amazon. That's nice. Uh, I said, you've already, most of you guys have already bought this anyway. Um, here's a free copy of the, the first book uh, with the additional stuff. I don't, I don't want to charge you twice just to get the extra, the extra uh, 16,000 words. Uh, I don't want to charge you again for it. So, you know, here. Um, and I had a lot of downloads of that first book and that also refreshed their attention to the series. So a lot of people I think who had read like the first two or three went on to read four, five, six, seven at that point, mm -hmm. which I, I think really helped a lot too. Um, and, uh, that refreshed their interest in the series, which kept, you know, got things, got things moving again. Makes sense. In the case of, so I did this with expanded books the first time. This past fall, I've done it with simply relaunched books. 
uh, no changes. Uh, I rebranded one series and I'm re currently rebranding a second series to merge into the same universe. So I, I wrote the Accord series a while back, the Accord of Honor um, series. And that was a trilogy. I wrote two more books over the summer and fall, which extended that trilogy into a quintet. And there's actually going to be a sixth. But I also, in the process, merged another set of books, a lit RPG series, into the same universe because some of the characters from that series carry on into the, the, the now expanded Accord series. So the main series has now been rebranded as the, uh, as the Ragnarok Saga, book one, two, three, four, five. And the Valhalla books, Valhalla online books, are about to be rebranded as, uh, as, as a, a Ragnarok Saga story. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, borrowing from Star Wars. Uh, you know, like the Han Solo story. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a Ragnarok Saga story. Uh, and uh, uh, that tells readers it's in the same universe. And if they like those other books, maybe they'll like these two sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't change these books, the Accord series. I did re-release them as a new book, take down the old ones, uh, ask Amazon to port the reviews over, which they will do for a second edition. So I re-released re it as a second edition with a new ISPN and a new ASIN, uh, which is because this is actually what traditional publishers do. When they release a new book, they don't release it under the same ISBN as the original. They release it under a new edition as a new ISBN. Mm. Uh, I'm just following the traditional publishing, you know, pattern here. And these books were a lot older. These books are dating back to like 2011 or 2012. Okay. Uh, so they, they, they'd sat for quite a while and I'm just like, I'm just going to start fresh with a, a, a new rebranding into the overall series arc and a second edition in order to, um, pop them back up again. Yeah. Into visibility. Well, the point you make about what traditional authors do, a lot of times when they're putting out that next edition, they're not changing the book at all. They're just putting up a new preface, right? Right. And I put up new author's notes and uh, a new cover uh, and rebranded the cover into the new series. And, and that was, that was the, those were the changes on this one. Mm -hmm. And it did not splash as heavily as, um, as the Starship Satori series did. Uh, but it has made a difference in sales there as well. A uh, significant one. The books that weren't really selling at all for a long time are now selling again. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a valuable tool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, the, the, the thing I would warn people to, about it is, is I would not overuse it. Um, traditional publishers only do this every five or ten years, I think, on on. on uh, as a usual thing, if they have a popular author, they might re-release Stephen King's old books every once in a while. You know, they'll come up with some of his older books in a new format, in a new, uh, mm -hmm. new, and I think that's fine uh, to pop them up every once in a while. If you try doing this every three months in order to, you know, just take down the book and put it up again every three months to get the new 90 days window start, I, I think Amazon's going to call, going to cry foul. Mm -hmm. If we act as indie authors, like we're like we are professional publishing presses, and we do comport ourselves in the same manner as the big five publishers do, then I think Amazon will look on what we're doing as just what professional people do. Mm. If we start trying to take advantage of systems in ways that are unfair to the other authors, then I think that they're going to probably say goodbye. <laughs> don't don't do that anymore. Mm. Well, and, um, in a particular genre, if you're trying to relaunch every three months, uh, I, I'm, I would question if you're really going to find a new audience doing that, right? I, I don't think you would. I don't think it would work anywhere near as well. No. Uh, I, I think that part of what this does is it picks up the new audience who's come in since then because Amazon's constantly adding new readers all the time. Mm -hmm. I think it also just catches the eye of people who hadn't seen it before uh, you know, who were in, but hadn't, you know, they just missed it before. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that doing it periodically, it's kind of like, you know, you don't want to do, uh, uh, a, a bargain book seat on your book every month. You know, they say you do it every three. I honestly wouldn't even do it that often. I, you know, like I, I would, you know, do a bargain book seat, uh, infrequently because you want to do, you want to get maximum bang for your buck with each time you do it. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, you know, same with this. This is a tool to pull out periodically when you have good reason. In, in it, I've done it twice now, once when I was greatly expanding the initial books in order to make them longer because my series, my books, the later books in the series were getting longer and longer. And the other time to rebrand two series under a single brand name. Mm -hmm. to rebrand the Accord books and the Valhalla books into the Ragnarok saga. Um, so I would do it if you have a reason to do it. I would do it if you have some kind of intentional change that you're going to make. Sure. And, and sure. then I think it can really make a big difference. Well, and I th something that's sort of similar is if you're, like with those series, you're continuing and then you start to release box sets, that, that creates kind of a similar deal where you're bringing out, you know, those three books or those, you know, the next three books in that series out under a different number um, and getting that refresh in the algorithm. Yeah. Um, I, I, so I think there's some ways you can do it that are respectful of the process and you're, you're doing it for a good reason because I know from the stuff that I've done with my fiction pen name is w once I put out a, a, a box set into KU, there's just a significant amount more readers that are going to download that book and start reading that because it's 1,100 pages, not 300 pages. Mm -hmm. It's one slot in there unlimited, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? So, yeah. like... I, I've done that before too. It's like, oh, there's a box on, on, on KU. I'll grab all of them, you know? Yeah, yeah. It counts as one slot and now. And if I like it, I, oh my God, I just finished the box set. How did that happen? And, and box sets are great for KU for getting yeah. the, you know, you know, uh, for getting the, the full uh, KENPC. Uh, yeah. Box sets are really good for that. And, you, and a 99 cent box set offer can actually net a great deal of income because of KU. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's good to throw those on, on special offer every once in a while, pop them up in the ranks through 99 cent sales. And then all the KU readers see it and they're like, Oh, that's a good deal. I'll grab that. Yeah. Well, this has been really enlightening, Kevin. Uh, I always enjoy spending some time with you and hearing uh, about what you're up to. Um, you know, you're one of the authors that uh, thinks about this like a business and you're, you're clearly applying some analysis to what you're trying to do? I try to. Yeah. Um, what, what's kind of coming up for you in 2019 I, before we kind of go, like, do you go through any kind of planning or? I do. Um, so I, I, I've actually, I've had a bad habit throughout my writing career of doing like this. I want to do all of the things and, and, and then, burning myself out trying to reach those goals mm -hmm. and then feeling badly about having burned myself out of it and not reaching the goals. So what I'm working on for 2019 is about sustainability. Mm -hmm. I want to have an author career that lasts for decades. So 2019 is about finding sustainable work levels that I can just keep on going week after week after week forever. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to still write a lot of books. I'm going to write at least a book a month. Um, but I'm going to do it in a way that feels comfortable and sustainable and uh, uh, not, not burn myself out, have fun mm -hmm. with it, but also continue to put out good words. That's great. Uh, I was talking to a lot of folks at the conference this year about kind of a, a variant of that is where they, they set themselves up for, you know, unachievable goals and that, not only do they say, well, listen, I'm going to put out 12 books in a year and they really probably don't have that capacity to write that, but they don't have the capital to actually put out those many books. Mm. Right? And where they get jammed up is they run out of working capital and then they get super, super disappointed because they never were able to achieve that goal. Well, the reality is if you did a little bit of planning and you looked at what it would cost and you realize you don't have that money, you can reset your expectations, right? Your personal expectations, like, hey, listen, even if I could write a book a month, I don't have the cash to do it. So I'm gonna write four books this year because that's what I have the money to do right. And then actually that's an achievable goal that's been well-planned. Right, 
Yeah, planning out every step of the way. I'm actually using a three-month calendar. I've got marked down how much I'm supposed to be doing on different days. So I know if I'm, if I'm on track or if I'm falling behind or if I'm getting ahead. And uh, I can adjust too. If I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm doing a little bit better on these days here, I, I can adjust my future, my, my, my future planning around that. I can mm-hmm. adjust down if I need to adjust down too. It, it lets me kind of like shift fire and always be looking three months ahead. The other one, um, is there something that, and you might not have this to, you know, top of your head, but is there something that you did in 2017, excuse me, 2018, that you wouldn't, you know, you don't want to ever do again? Like you, you, you thought it would be a good idea and you just kind of realize now it didn't work. <laughs> no <laughs> okay well <laughs> not really no get sick <laughs> yeah, yeah don't, don't get deathly ill <laughs> yeah uh yeah the the first half of the year was not so so much fun my writing they hurt my writing production a lot the other thing is don't worry about it. i guess i would say don't worry about that so much yeah you know like uh find ways of dealing understand that life is going to happen sometimes and get just get right back into it when, when, once once i can so mm. that way uh you know, like the, the worry and stress that I put on myself for having that bad production first half of the year was probably more than it was warranted. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, well, like I said, it's always good to talk to you and always great uh, to talk to you. Yeah. And, um, Wish you the best in 2019. It'll be exciting to see um, what you have coming out. Yeah, it'll be cool and fun. So, <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Kevin. No problem. Take care now.